Good evening, everybody. And welcome to the April 25th, 2023 Board of Education meeting for Arlington Heights School District 25. Tonight's me meeting includes the reorganization of the Board of Education as well. Um, and I call the meeting to order for April 25th, 2023. Lana, if you could please call the roll. Conley? Here. Olenichak? Here. Cerniglia? Here. Jogi? Here. Scapolato? Here. Filipek? Here. Faso? Here. Thank you. Uh, please, if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed the Music for Youth performance like we did, that we're so happy that we're here. Today is a, a special day for the board with so many good things happening and so many great recognitions and acknowledgments of gratitude uh, going to be happening as well today. So thank you to Music for Youth, and thank you for staying and kind of learning about civic engagement. We appreciate you being in the audience. Um, today we have no, as far as recognitions and presentations, we have no recognitions scheduled for tonight, but the board looks forward to recognizing more students and staff at our May meeting uh, that will be coming up. Um, and we'll go start off with board communications. We'll move on um, as far as board member updates. Do any of my colleagues have any updates to share today? Uh, speaking of Music for Youth, Fiddle Fest for Music for Youth this Thursday afternoon uh, at Thomas Middle School. So if you liked what you heard here tonight, there's even more Thursday evening. So hopefully you'll see a lot of people there. Oh, very cool, Fiddle Fest. Um, Lana, if you put that on our calendars, we will try and make it. I feel like if it's not in our calendar, then we're, we're at these things. And it, uh, Lana, thanks for keeping us organized. Thanks, Scott. Um, and Ed Red, uh, any updates from Ed Red, Rich? Uh, thank you. Just a brief update. We had our uh, meeting, was it last week, I think it was? Time flies. So last week or the week before, I forget. Um, but we had a guest speaker, uh, Michelle Munson. She was a representative for the state of Illinois, so she came to speak. Um, talked about a couple things, uh, you know, that are on the dockets that are coming up. Um, one of her main points was that across the state or, you know, the state legislatures are worried about a, re um, a reduction in revenue. Um, and, you know, what she, you know, personally what she failed to communicate is just something that we had learned about, Leo you know, last year when all the COVID fund state funding actually runs out, there will be a significant you know, dip in revenue for the state and the state is gonna to have to try to balance that. So that, she said that's something that they're worried about at this point. Um, she talked more about uh, evidence-based funding and that's a continual discussion um, around how to really make that more appropriate or continue to modify that. Um, talked about uh, a thing on the docket that uh, legislators are talking about is trying to introduce financial literacy um, types of uh, content um, to teach kids about, uh, you know, everything that they need to, everything, you know, even in the high school levels about how to do loans, things of that nature. A um, couple things that maybe sparked a lot of conversation was full day kindergarten is uh, at, I think right now sitting at the Senate. Um, if that passes, then full day kindergarten state would be mandated statewide um, starting the 27 and 28 school year. And obviously there was a lot of discussions around great, but for those districts that don't have it, who's gonna fund it? And you know, all those wonderful questions, same types of things that we went through um, last year. The second uh, item that really came out uh, uh, a lot was right now it's more in uh, just conversation is about going to a $20 an hour minimum wage for all uh, folks that work in the educational area. Um, that would be as soon as 24 and 25 school year. Um, potentially so that has a dramatic effect on a bunch of different areas and again a lot of folks were saying great but how are we going to afford that right um, that's a significant increase from where we are right now um, so those were the, uh, the the main particular topics from that session okay. thanks so much rich uh, for that update um, since we went through the kindergarten maybe we can chime in and they can <laughs> learn from our notes like our copious notes um, Thanks, Rich. Uh, any ISB updates? 
Um, I have none today. The conference is far away, so we have time. But any other uh, updates? No? Okay. Um, NSSEO. With that beautiful weather we've had recently and kind of getting back to normal here, uh, it's got us in the mood of golfing. Uh, the NSSEO golf outing is June 3rd coming up. Uh, so if you're so interested in uh, participating in that and uh, raising funds for NSSEO, get your applications in uh, to uh, Timber Ridge School by May 26th is the deadline. So um, the flyer's out there. We can forward it on to you if you're interested. But uh, that's uh, the latest and greatest uh, fundraising opportunity to benefit the kids in SSEO. So think warm weather. That's all I have. Thank you. It's been an honor to serve on the SSEO board. Thank you, Scott. We have so appreciated all your updates and enthusiasm and kind of dedication not only to our board but to NSSEO as well. And we'll talk more about that. You're not off the hook today. We have a lot to talk about today as far as Scott and, and Chad. Um, so tell me, um, Scott, as far as NSSEO and the golf outing, uh, is it nine holes or 18? It's 18. You know, I don't know specifically, but I do know there is a uh, banquet afterwards uh, okay. at Old Orchard. So, <laughs> so it starts at, yes. <laughs> yeah. no, I don't yeah. think the DJ is going to be there. because. So if we're not the best golf place, we could go eat. We could go eat, yeah. Okay, th thanks, Scott. Um, okay, we will now be moving on to the community input portion of our meeting today. And um, if you wish to address any item on the agenda, please complete one of the blue forms provided on the table in the lobby and hand the card to Lana O'Brien, the recording secretary for the Board of Education. I, thank you, Chad. And I'm also going to be. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to uh, share with our audience today that the opportunity to speak to the board is provided for members of the public who have a comment to make about the business of the board. The board appreciates hearing from stakeholders and values your thoughts and questions. As the board strives to make the best decisions for the board and for the district, public input can be helpful. In order for the board to reserve sufficient time to conduct its business and to operate its meetings in the spirit of civility and decorum, speakers are expected to follow these guidelines. Number one, address the board only at the time provided on the agenda and only after being recognized by the board president. Number two, identify yourself and be brief. Your comments must be limited to a maximum of three minutes. The board may shorten this allowed time in order to conserve time to allow the maximum number of people the opportunity to speak. And please be respectful and courteous. And the board requests that you not make any statements that are personally disrespectful or condescending to members of the board and especially our staff. The board typically does not respond to comments or attempt to answer questions during the public comment period, but we do listen intently and appreciate the input from our community. And if you would like a response back, uh, we encourage you to uh, share your email and your phone number and your, uh, your um, contact information so we can get back in touch with you to follow up. Our first public comment is from Ms. Sheila Cruz. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you. My name is Sheila Cruz. I'm reading a short passage from a book about indoctrination. It's authored by an Indonesian who came to the United States to study zoology, but got sidetracked by the political movements of the 1970s. He worked for a new left printing agencies, publishing political content along the lines of socialism, collectivism, all those isms. In a Santo Nagra's book, A is for Activism, came under the radar of Seven Stories Press, known for its large collection of activist nonfiction. And recognizing that young minds are amenable, this book is on the shelf at Patton Elementary School, another example of a book inappropriate for five, six, and seven-year-olds. Might look familiar. A is for activism, one of the pages. Oh, subliminal, maybe, maybe not. Make up your mind. Here's a little snippet. D is for democracy. More than voting, you agree, dictators detest it. Donkeys don't get it. But you and me, we demand equality. 
Indigenous and immigrant, together we stand tall. Our histories are relevant. An injury to one is an injury to all. LGBTQ, love who you choose. Love is true. Liberate your notions of limited emotions. Celebrate with pride our links of devotion. PPP smarge, pro pro protest, pow pow power to the people. T for tans, T for tiaras, T for trans and trains and tulips and tractors. Trust the true, the, the true, the he, she, they, that is you. U is for weekends, U is for workers' rights. Whoops, no, that's a W. U is for union, union, yes. <sighs> Subliminal messaging isn't about learning the alphabet or how to spell and form sentences something five and six and seven year olds should be taught. Instead, words that are not in their vocabulary nor on a spelling test for this age group are peppered confusingly throughout this book. Dictator, democracy, indigenous, liberate, trans, diversity, to name a few. The concepts that these words refer to are also beyond this age group's knowledge. Why would you acquire this book and promote it to kids that are still learning to tie their shoes? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Ed Lipinski. Welcome. My name is Ed Lipinski, and I'm here to read excerpts from The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi, uh, pages 25, 26, 96, 97, 202, and 225. Um, it is important for me to mention that this book is available in both the library and ELA curriculum, and the author has admitted to committing sexual assault, and the award that this book had received was rescinded. I spend hours in the bathroom with a magazine that has 1,000 pictures of naked movie stars. Naked woman plus right hand equals happy, happy, joy, joy. Yep, that's right. I admit that I masturbate. I am proud of it. I'm good at it. I'm ambidextrous. If there were a professional masturbators league, I'd be drafted number one and make millions of dollars. And maybe you're thinking, well, you really shouldn't be talking about masturbation in public. Well, tough. I'm going to talk about it because everybody does it and everybody likes it. And if God hadn't wanted us to masturbate, then God would not have given us thumbs. So I thank God for my thumbs. But the thing is, no matter how much time my thumbs and I spend with the curves of imaginary women, I am much more in love with the right angles of buildings. I love that tree, I said. That's because you're a tree fag, Rowdy said. I'm not a tree fag, I said. Then how come you like to stick your dick inside knot holes? I stick my dick in the girl trees, I said. <clears throat> did you just say books should give me a boner? Yes, I did. Are you serious? Yeah, don't you get excited about books? I don't think you're supposed to get that excited about books. <clears throat> you should get a boner. You have to get a boner, Gordy shouted. Come on. We ran into the Reardon High School Library. Look at all these books, he said. Now doesn't that give you a boner? I am rock hard, I said. Gordy blushed. Well, I don't mean boner in the sexual sense, Gordy said. I don't think you should run through life with a real erect penis, but you should approach each book, you should approach, e approach life with the real possibility that you might get a metaphorical boner at any point. Yup, I had a big erection when I learned of my sister's death. How perverted is that? How inappropriately hormonal can one boy be? And I don't know if it's me, but I feel like there's little to absolutely zero educational content in reading these excerpts, and I'm questioning what it is exactly you're trying to teach our children. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Barbara Watts. Good evening. I am a mother of three District 25 students, and I've been watching the District 25 meetings and been concerned about what I've seen. I want to start with a quote by George R. R. Martin. A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, and the man who never reads lives only one. And that's the point of books, isn't it? It's to provide us with windows into worlds we don't or can't know. We get to see things from another person's perspectives. The stories allow us to have empathy for others. Sometimes books let us understand that we aren't alone. 
others are like us. Sometimes books help us learn about our world, and sometimes books help us learn about us. And that's why I love to read, and that's why my kids love to read. I am here in support of the librarians, the teachers, and the administrators, working to protect the freedom of thought. While we can pick passages out without context to crucify an author or an idea, a sentence is not a story, and a passage is not a novel. In the Bible, there are passages about rape, sodomy, and incest, and yet not a single person has walked in and asked that that book be removed. This is because context matters. Critical thinking matters. It is our job as parents to help our kids understand that context with what they're reading. There are things that our kids will read that will not be pleasant. There are things that they will read that will be uncomfortable. But you know what? That is life. The world is sometimes unpleasant and it is sometimes uncomfortable. And it is our job as parents to prepare our kids for the world that they will inherit as adults. And we do this through teaching. And teaching sometimes happens through books. Was the Titanic sad, as a parent mentioned last time? Absolutely. Should, that erase, should we erase that from our libraries and pretend it didn't happen? No. We can't pretend that it didn't happen. We can't pretend the Holocaust or the Civil War or slavery didn't happen. They did happen. We cannot erase events from history because we didn't like them because they are uncomfortable. We are still living with the ramifications of this history. And who anyway decides what is too unpleasant or too uncomfortable? And while I appreciate that parents might not want their kids to read certain books, they should not force their beliefs on other families, on my family. Our job as parents is to raise kids who are curious and informed and empathetic, and kids who will become adults equipped with the critical thinking skills to take on their future roles. I want these stories to remain in the library so that my kids can know worlds that they don't have access to. They should understand what it's like to be gay if they're cis. They should understand what it is like to see the world through a Native American's Thank eyes like Sherman Alexie. Thank you, Ms. Watts. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Our next uh, speaker is Pat Sheridan. Welcome. Did I just start? Yes, please. All right. My name is Patrick Sheridan. I'm with an uh, organization called Gays Against Groomers. We're mostly focused on uh, stopping indoctrination of children using the guise of LGBTQ. Uh, the reason why I'm here today is because there is a book available in the school that I believe is mandatorily taught called Julian is a Mermaid. Um, all over the country, as we're aware, uh, the sort of the gender issues specifically involving kids is huge, and there's states that are banning gender-affirming care. There are states that are acting as a refuge for people that would like to transition their children. Uh, in Europe, most of these European countries that have been dealing with gender-affirming care have suspended it until further notice. Uh, the European countries use what is called the Dutch Protocol, which is a protocol with strict and severe guidelines in order to help a child understand if they are trans or they are not trans. Now, the Dutch Protocol in and of itself is actually extremely flawed as well. The people that conducted the studies are gender ideologues that believe gender is non-binary so the purpose of the study seems for the purpose of the study seems for these people to be able to sort of reinforce their worldview uh, that the idea of man and woman is a social construct and is not actually real or based in biology the people that believe this are religious zealots. Um, and in America, we follow what is known as the affirmation model, which is literally just listening to children. There's not really any studies or any uh, in-depth analysis or uh, sort of waiting around to see if a child's gender dysphoria uh, clears up. Uh, the affirmation model is a method of madness that only the United States and a couple other Western countries actually implement. And this book, Julian is a Mermaid, specifically states that because Julian believes he is a mermaid, uh, that makes him actually a mermaid. Of course, this is a thinly veiled metaphor for the transgender, uh, I guess you could say agenda, although that sounds paranoid. Um, so Julian is a mermaid, if children read this, will push them down a path that will 
lead them to receive chemicals in their bodies. One of those chemicals is Lupron, which is actually uh, used to sterilize and chemically castrate pedophiles. It's one of the main things that they give these children when they perform these experiments. I call them eugenics experiments uh, on these children. And if you provide this book, Julian is a Mermaid, to these children, uh, it will push them down an affirmation pipeline that will inevitably end up with many of them receiving these chemicals and then eventually having their genitalia mutilated so their outer appearance can meet their internal identity. Um, and a lot of these kids are gay and a lot of them would end up being gay. Uh, so a lot of these kids will end up being butchered um, and eventually there will be lots of lawsuits. I highly recommend you remove this book from the school. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Peck. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, porn addiction. For several months now, we've been hearing from concerned parents across the nation voice their deep concern with pornography being introduced within middle and high schools through books. Most recently in Michigan, we heard of a lawsuit placed against the school district for not implementing a common sense policy that would keep students safe from sexually explicit content and pornography within books. In the school district, parents feel that there is also a disconnect between you, our school board, and your understanding of the effects of pornography on the child and the adolescent brain. Concerned parents understand that por pornography is like a gateway drug to a host of psychological, sexual, and social dilemmas. I'd like to read what common sense research tells us about pornography. Pornography use increases the, mar the martial infidelity rate by more than 300%. I'm sorry, the marital rate. Among couples affected by one spouse's addiction, two thirds experience a loss of interest in sexual intercourse. Pornography is frequently a major factor in infidelity and divorce. Pornography viewing leads to a loss of interest in good family relations. Pornography is addictive and neuroscientists are beginning to map its biological substrate. Users tend to become desensitized to the type of pornography they use and then seek more perverse forms of pornography stimulation. They state that men who view pornography regularly have a higher tolerance for abnormal sexuality including rape, sexual aggression, and sexual promiscuity. Prolonged consumption of pornography by men produces stronger notions of women as commodities or as sex objects. Child sex offenders are more likely to view pornography regularly or to be involved in its distribution. Now with that said, why on earth are you as, a school, as school board members on board with propagating media that showcases pornography? By allowing the free circulation of porno porn pornographic books, you are in essence disguising yourselves as the arbitrators of truth on sexual formation and ethics when you are far from it. The research on pornography is on point. It acts as a gateway to disastrous social relations and objectifies both men and women. Why do you insist that these books be part of our curriculum or part of our student libraries? Why do these concerns fall deaf on your ears? If we are concerned with the healthy formation of our students and the healthy formation of their future families of this community, would you not at, le at the least have a conversation surrounding setting up a process whereby Thank parents so much. who feel ob objections to sexually explicit material can protect their children from assessing the content? This Thank you is so the much. least you can do. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Sandra Bachar. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Glad to be here. I am reading a book by, <clears throat> called Rick by Alex Gino, <clears throat> page 130. I was thinking that we could spend the meeting talking a bit about what we want to do this year in an organization. Zoe's hand was up immediately. I think we need to have better books in the library. 
I mean, look at us. We're in the rainbow spectrum, and we're still learning a lot of stuff. Yeah, said Xavier, and some kids might not have friends they, ca they can talk to about Quilt Bag Plus, so if they could find some good books in the library, it could really help them. That's very thoughtful, you, thoughtful of you, said Mr. Sidney, but books cost money. Well, we could have a fundraiser, said Allie. We were saying at the end of last year that we wanted to get more involved in educating the whole school on queer issues, said Yaya. So let's go dancing, said Zoe, all in favor of raising money to get new books and queer content into the school library, raise your hand. So many kids raised their hands that they didn't even bother counting them. That settles it, said Zoe, we're having a fundraiser, or should I say a fundraiser? We're the rainbow spectrum. We've got to do something exciting, something that makes people think it's cool to be, and I didn't know that, that they added these letters, LGBTQIAP+. Okay, I'm gonna have to get that one down. Okay, page 228. The most common acronym these days to represent this range is LGBTQIA+, practice makes perfect saying it, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, pansexual, and more. The plus sign acknowledges that our understanding of sexuality is growing and that many people use other language to describe themselves. I've also used the term quilt bag plus. I like that one. Queer, unsure, intersex, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, asexual. I know that one. I remember that one. Gay and more. In this book, however, I don't think quilt bag plus is perfect. I wish it included pansexuality. And some people don't like the bag ending. I hope that I have done justice to the real life process of developing language in the way I represent the rainbow spectrum's conversations. And I look forward to what comes next as we continue to refine language to meet our needs. If you've been thinking about your own gender and or sexuality, you can research online for terms that might help you put a new name, to put a name to how you're feeling. And if you don't know how you're feeling, there's language for that too. Questioning and being unsure are real parts of life, especially if you might not be straight or cisgender. I went to Chicago Public Schools and I have to tell you, I never once learned anything about this. So this wasn't a part of my growing up. I, I don't understand, I don't remember anything about this. So this is all new to me. If this is the way that the future is going, I really don't think our kids need this in their future. Okay, wait, hold Th on. Thank you so much, your time is up, ma'am. Oh, but there's, there's, there's places they can go to yeah. get all of this information in the books. Thank you so much. Phone numbers that they can call. This is sickening. Thank you. Hey. Lana, we have no more, correct? Okay, thank you, Lana. Um, we are now going to be moving on to communications from district partners. Uh, first up, um, I'm not, I don't think we have PTA here today. Not able to be here tonight. Okay, no problem. Uh, we appreciate all the hard work. Uh, ABC 25 Foundation, Gina, we had a really exciting time for ABC 25. We're looking forward to hear from you. We did. Uh, it was another successful year with another successful um, race. So ABC 25 is exhaling and they're going to step back and take a break and plan for next year. Thank you to everybody who came out. Um, thank you to all of our wonderful mascots and for everybody who was willing to run that race. It was beautiful weather. We were very, very lucky considering last weekend we had the delayed snow that we had. Um, thank you to our DJ. And uh, overall, um, the foundation is going to look forward now as we get ready for next year, welcoming new friends, new families, uh, new community members to come in and support our teachers who are gonna continue to inspire our kids uh, for the future as we now give away all the money we've raised, <laughs> which is the most exciting part about the foundation. Uh, thank you so much, Gina. And Gina, we so appreciate, you know, uh, Gina, right? Be, serving on a board is a lot of time. And on top of that, Gina, you serve on the ABC Foundation as well. So thank you for all the time that you take. And truly that event, that it wasn't a cold day, it was 80 degrees, right? And our mascots, or many of our educators and principals, they, they revealed themselves and they were like red because it was so, so hot that day. Uh, our DJ, Scott Philippeck did an amazing job with his co-DJ, right? that was fun. Uh, and, and, and truly, it really is, it, it shows an event like that, 
really shows our district how lucky we are to be in this super rich community as far as so many volunteers, so many people participating, our parents, our students, really fast little runners. Um, I was the caboose voluntarily, so I walked. Uh, Scott K was way ahead of me uh, running, so uh, thank you so much to, to everybody and all our administrators. Th thanks, Gina, um, for that report. Uh, next up, we have ATA, Allison Berg. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. As usual, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share some things going on around the district. Um, I wanted to just take a minute to spotlight a few different schools tonight, not any one in particular. Two board meetings a month throws me on that one. Anyways, um, Ivy Hill will be hosting a multicultural fair this Thursday, April 27th. So if you're free, you should go to check it out. At Westgate, fifth graders read a novel, A Long Walk to Water, by Linda Sue Park as a class read aloud. The students wanted to learn more about how they could help the water crisis that's happening in South Sudan. So they researched, they watched TED Talks and other videos, they read articles and realized how passionate they were about making a small difference in a South Sudan village. So students prepared a proposal for Dr. Buck, their principal, and the building leadership team to get approval for an all-school fundraiser. Students then planned and presented an assembly to kick off the fundraiser on Wednesday, March 22nd. Following that assembly, the kids provided weekly blurbs to be sent out to the Westgate community. They did video announcements to share their progress of the fundraiser and to provide updates to all the students and staff. Students made sure to send thank you emails to those who were able to donate, and their ultimate goal was to raise $15,000. The amount would fund the drilling of one well in one South Sudan village. This clean water source would save thousands of lives, provide an opportunity for girls to go to school instead of walking miles and miles to gather water every day, provide and help sustain a good source of food for families and livestock, and also help to provide clean water to, med to medical facilities. These are only some of the positive outcomes of a well in one village, and the students in Westgate did it. The students work together to help people halfway around the world to have a healthier and better life. Their teacher, Mrs. Darby, is so proud of their hard work, motivation, and empathy that these 11-year-olds demonstrated, and it will be a life lesson that will not be soon forgotten. So shout out to Westgate on that awesome project. At Patton last Friday, the teachers organized a Math in My Life Day, which invited 10 speakers, parents, and community members to come in to share with fourth and fifth graders about how they use math in their everyday lives. There were six 20-minute sessions that kids were able to choose um, kids were able to choose those that interested them the most. Each student had a personalized schedule to follow for the morning. The guest speakers ranged from a 3D pool designer to an accident recreation specialist and to none other than our very own Stacy Malik as one of the guest speakers to talk about math in the real world. It was an awesome experience had by all, so shout out to Patton. The Special Olympics did not go off as we had hoped. Uh, it was a very cold, rainy, snowy, terrible day. Um, but today at Windsor, the students who did not get a chance to participate had a rain date event out at Windsor School this afternoon. I don't have any pictures or any updates from it because I was at another meeting, but I shall follow up with that. But all students, if they weren't able to participate on the actual event, got to participate today and show their skills that they'd been practicing for. And last but not least, Thomas students performed in Newsies, the musical over the weekend, and also our Science Olympiad team over at Thomas placed in the state competition this past weekend as well. So that's a little bit of news from around District 25. Thanks again for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank, Thank you so night. much. Thanks so much. Um, well, we, even with the meeting twice a month, you had a lot to fill your time slots. So I think because of all the exciting things that happen in the district, right? Uh, and it's in incredible that a uh, classroom here in Arlington Heights is supporting a project halfway across the world in Sudan. So as far as our mission to empower an inclusive, diverse community of learners to innovate and thrive as global citizens, our teachers and our educators are, are definitely helping us amplify that mission. So. Much appreciated to everything that's happening. And thanks, Stacy, for your math whiz sharing in the classroom. <laughs> yeah, we, we learn a lot from Stacy as well as far as being fiscally responsible as board members. Um, we will now move on to approval of consent agenda, which is an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Madam President. 
Yes, Greg. I move that the Board of Education approve those items on the consent agenda as follows. A, personnel report and addendum to personnel report. B, treasurer's report. C, invoices. D, regular and closed session meeting minutes of April 11th, 2023. Thank you, Greg. Please may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Lana, please could you call the vote? Olenichak? Yes. Cerniglia? Yes. Jogi? Yes. Scapolato? Yes. Filipek? Yes. Faso? Yes. Conley? Yes. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have a uh, superintendent report as far as uh, the student, suspe uh, student suspension review, which is an action item. Uh, this, can I have a motion, please? M Madam President? Yes, Greg. I move that the Board of Education uphold the suspension for student 23S408MS. I'll second. Thank you, uh, Scott. Dr. Bide, is there any information you need to share? Uh, no, no additional information. Okay. Um, before, uh, well, Lana, go ahead and call the vote, and then I have a statement. Cerniglia? Yes. Jogi? Yes. Scapolato? Yes. Filipek? Yes. Faso? Yes. Conley? Yes. Olenichuk. So I don't agree with the, uh, the actions. Um, I don't think this should follow the student, even temporarily. My vote is no. Okay. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Board of Education, uh, the, the members who, the majority of the Board of Education, I want to state that significant thought was given to the student suspension process. The Board's decision for this hearing has been made with significant consideration and an understanding that all required procedures of due process were followed by the district. Ultimately, for our board and this district, the goal for each student is, that they are con is their continued growth and well-being. Um, I will, uh, since we've already taken the vote, I'm going to move on to um, acceptance of the Canvas elections. Madam and President? Yes. I move that the Board of Education adopt the resolution canvas of election results. Okay, th thank you so much, Scott. Um, uh, Dr. Bynt, would you read the resolution? Oh, well, uh, we yeah. second, well, I need a second, please. A second. Thank you, Rich. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, Dr. Bynt, would you please read the resolution? Yes, I will. Um, state law does require that the resolution canvas of election results um, be read out loud. Be it, be it, and it is hereby resolved by the Board of Education of School District 25, Cook County, Illinois, that the attached abstract of votes of the election held on April 4th, 2023, to elect three members for full four-year terms to said Board of Education is a true and correct canvas of the certificate of results of each precinct thereof as submitted to this board by the election authority, the Cook County Clerk. Be it further resolved that said abstract of vote shall be signed by each member of this Board of Education. That it is hereby found and determined that Elizabeth Nierman, Kevin Michael, and Brian Cerniglia received the highest number of votes cast for the three full four-year terms and each has been elected as a member of the Board of Education, Arlington Heights School District 25. Thank you, Dr. Fine. Lana, could you please call for a vote? Jogi? Yes. Scapolato? Yes. Filipek? Yes. Faso? Yes. Conley? Yes. Olenichak? Yes. Cerniglia? Sure, <laughs> Your mic wasn't on. It doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You stole my mic. <laughs> Board members, the resolution needs all of our signatures, so please make sure you sign it before leaving this evening. Thank you. Um, at this point, the board, we're going to be recognizing our outgoing board members. Um, and the board would like to recognize Chad Conley and Scott Filipek. And together as a board, we have contributed our sentiments of gratitude that I will be sharing today on behalf of the board. And first of all, to both of you, we say, Thank you, and, and I have it in all caps here on my paper, so thank you so much. 
Thank you to you both for your years of volunteer service to our school district community. Thank you for your contributions, and most importantly, thank you for your friendship. So when I say thank yous, I start crying, so today I'm not gonna cry, okay? <laughs> uh, we have many good memories of working constructively and collaboratively with both of you, and even though we may not have always agreed on every topic, we always reach a common ground respectfully in our efforts to support the goals of the district for the sake of our students. You both brought passion, intellect, insight, and experiences to the table, making us a better team for sure. You were both integral to the advances we have made in our district. And during difficult times, you led with conviction, helping amplify the district's vision for the sake of our students. And thank you for challenging our board team to ensure that our district can be the best that it can be. It has been an honor serving with both of you. And we can honestly say that through our time volunteering together, the best outcome of all is our friendship that will remain far beyond the great work that we did here together in the city of Good Neighbors. So thank you to you both. I'm gonna, um, because our board likes to embarrass our colleagues even more, we're going to, uh, I'm gonna call each of our colleagues up one at a time um, to the front so you don't get off Scott easy, like mm -hmm. I say. Oh, and that was no pun intended. So um, I'm gonna go over to the front, Dr. Fine, will you join bring me? these? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So Chad, I'll begin with you, okay? So um, from all of us, I wanna say, dear Chad, thank you for serving as a District 25 Board of Education member for six years. Your ability to keep calm and level-headed in every situation is much appreciated. Your people skills have been a tremendous asset to this board, particularly during the challenging times during the pandemic. Your ability to speak to the core issues in any discussion, bringing a level of clarity to our deliberations is so valued. And we recall how following a heated board discussion, you not only helped quickly diffuse the situation, but you also made us laugh, right? Um, just moments after. And so we so admire that you have already been planning other ways to positively impact, impact our district as a volunteer. So wrestling team, watch out. Uh, Ch Coach Chad is coming your way possibly. And so, Chad, this is definitely not goodbye. We wish you the very best, and we look forward to seeing you around town and on the wrestling mat, as we say, right? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, now it's our turn to uh, embarrass, and maybe hopefully not embarrass, to share, to share uh, most memorable moments with Scott. So Scott, thank you for serving as a District 25 Board of Education member for five years. You took time to connect with each of us personally, and that made a huge difference in developing a culture of trust. We appreciate your leadership in stepping up as board president during the pandemic, and that was no easy feat. You, your measured approach to board service, carefully considering all sides while working to ensure all viewpoints are respect, uh, you know, and are respected have been such value add to our board. Your willingness to listen and support your bo board colleagues was truly meaningful. You also made serving together so much fun, <laughs> right? So we will never forget your mad DJ skills at the ABC 25 challenge, and we hope that you will continue to bring your beats and wireless speakers to bring joy and music to future meaningful gatherings. So Scott, to you as well, we say this is not goodbye. We wish you the very best and look forward to seeing you uh, around town. Um, at, at this point, I'm going to, I know, 
I know Adam's going to want this picture, so I'd really like to call my board colleagues up so we can take a quick picture with, our, uh, with Chad and Scott. Thank you to you both. You minutes to let you gather, gather your stuff. <laughs> to get that thing in there just so you know. Take your time. Yeah. So I hear these two friends are going out for dinner. <laughs> so I had one thing I didn't get to do. Oh, oh I was I'm on so sorry, Sc uh, Scott. And, oh. and, and I know um, our friend Chad had said he had lost his voice, but I hear his voice now. But if, any, if either of you want to share a couple of words before you leave. I just want to say. Uh, <laughs> 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 You got three minutes. Yeah. Uh, I, I told Scott he could speak for 20 minutes. We're around. When I, when I first got here, I, I thanked people on the, 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 not the advice of my wife. She said I was, I was long-winded, and that's probably the most you're going to hear ever, you ever hear me talk. But uh, the day I got sworn in, uh, I thanked my wife, uh, my commander at the police department, Mark McGuffin, uh, the two deans at Prospect High School, Dr. Pat uh, Tadaldi Monti, and uh, Mark Taylor, and finally the psychologist at the school, uh, Dr. Jacob Johnson. Uh, they were the people who were influential in the way that I served children and uh, four or five different uh, philosophies on how to go about it. But the, at the end of the day, we all worked for the, the best interest of the kids. Um, I never thought we'd, we'd have that relationship ever again that we could ever recreate that. But this table right here is, is really through the hard times we've done that. And I, I appreciate that so much. Next time I, I thank people, your names will be the ones that are included in that. So thank you so much for your dedication to the kids and the dedication to our community. So. Thank you all for, for being there and through the hard times. And like you said, the not so pleasant conversations, at the end of the day, we always came to consensus and we're, we're friends for that uh, going forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. I, I, just, I, just, I just want to say thank you, to, um, especially to the group and, and everybody at the table. It's been great. Um, at the end of the day, again, it's all for the kids, right? We're here for the kids. It's important. And I, you know, I'll joke a lot, as you all know, um, but uh, I just appreciate everything you guys do, and it's been a great, great ride. And you know, I, I wish the new people good luck and happy trails on that one. So, have fun. You. Thank you, Chad. Like I said earlier, we, it is a special meeting for us, uh, saying thank you to good friends leaving and welcoming new friends coming on to the board today. So today is the organization and swearing in of, elect, of elected board members. Um, and I love how this whole formality happens right in the middle of a board meeting where, um, where name plaques are exchanged and so forth. Um, but we are so lucky. 
uh, to have such dedicated volunteers in our community. And the board welcomes two new board members today, Kevin Michael and Elizabeth Nierman. <laughs> we, we are also so happy to have Brian Cerniglia remain on the board for another four years. I will now be administering the oath of office to each person individually. And I think I'm going to go to the front uh, to do that. And uh, elected board members, as Anisha calls you to the front, you do have a copy of the oath of office. Please take it with you so you don't have to have it memorized. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we will start, uh, we'll go um, alphabetically, uh, last name, and so let's start with uh, Brian Cerniglia. Yeah, we're going to do one at a time. <laughs> we're also... A, <laughs> so we, we'll get to hear... Uh, Brian. Uh, Brian Come stand over here, Brian. Have a stand. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're we're going to check Brian's reading skills on this very long oath. So I will now administer the oath of office to each person individually. After each person takes the oath of office, that they will read. Uh, I invite you to share any comments that you'd like to express as you take your seat on the Arlington Heights School District 25 Board of Education. And for Brian, that would be one more time. So go for it, Brian. Your oath of office is in front of you. Uh -huh. So I, Brian Sniglia, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of the Member of the Board of Education of Arlington Heights and School District 25 in accordance with the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and the laws of the State of Illinois to the best of my ability. I further swear or affirm that I shall respect taxpayers' interests by serving as a faithful protector of the school district's assets. I shall encourage and respect the free expression of opinion by my fellow board members and others who seek a hearing before the board while respecting the privacy of students and employees. I shall recognize that a board member has no legal authority as an individual and that decisions can be made only by a majority vote at a public board meeting. I shall abide by majority decisions of the board while retaining the right to seek changes in such decisions through ethical and constructive channels. <clears throat> As part of the Board of Education, I shall accept the responsibility for my role in the equitable and quality education of every student in the school district. I shall foster with the board extensive participation of the community, formulate goals, define outcomes, and set the course for Arlington Heights School District 25. I shall assist in establishing a structure and an environment designed to ensure all students have the opportunity to attain their maximum potential through a sound organizational framework. I shall strive to ensure a continuous assessment of student achievement and all conditions affecting the education of our children in compliance with the law. I shall serve as education's key advocate on behalf of students in our community school to advance the vision of Arlington Heights School District 25. And finally, last but not least, I shall strive to work together with the district superintendent to lead the school district toward fulfilling the vision the board has created fostering excellence for every student in the areas of academic skills, knowledge, citizenship, and personal development, all of which once again. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Welcome again, Scott. <laughs> um, and uh, Kevin Michael, let me invite my new colleague up, Kevin. That was very good reading, Brian, good job. <laughs> Learn from the best. Yeah, there you go. I, Kevin Michael, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Member of the Board of Education of Arlington Heights, School District 25, in accordance with the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the laws of the State of Illinois to the best of my ability. I further swear that I shall respect taxpayer interests by serving as a faithful protector of the school district's assets. 
I shall encourage and respect the free expression of opinion by my fellow board members and others who seek a hearing before the board while respecting the privacy of students and employees. I shall recognize that a board member has no legal authority as an individual and that decisions can be made only by a majority vote at a public board meeting. I shall abide by the majority decisions of the board while retaining the right to seek changes in such decisions through ethical and constructive channels. As part of the Board of Education, I shall accept the responsibility for my role in the equitable and quality education of every student in the school district. I shall foster with the board extensive participation of the community, formulate goals, define outcomes, and set the course for Arlington Heights School District 25. I shall assist in establishing a structure and an environment designed to ensure all students have the opportunity to attain their maximum potential through a sound organizational framework. I could use some water. <laughs> I shall strive to ensure a continuous assessment of student achievement and all conditions affecting the education of our children in compliance with state law. I shall serve as education's key advocate on behalf of students and our community's school to advance the vision for Arlington Heights School District 25 and I shall strive to work together with the district superintendent to lead the school district toward fulfilling the vision of the board, fulfilling the vision the board has created, fostering excellence for every student in the areas of academic skills, knowledge, citizenship, and personal development. All right, Anisha had said I could speak. I promise I will be brief. Um, I want to thank everybody in the community who supported me through this process. Um, this is a responsibility and a privilege that I take incredibly seriously. And tonight in particular, I would like to thank my wife Jennifer and our daughters, Natalie and Carolyn, because I know you sacrificed a lot of time and a lot of attention that you normally would have received from me as I was out canvassing and uh, working to earn votes. So thank you all for your support, your patience, your understanding. I love you all and appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here's that water oh, that you needed. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, last but definitely not least, uh, we have Elizabeth Nearman. And I like how her family just got in right at the right time. So, so um, Liz, you have the oath right there. I, Elizabeth Nearman, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Member of the Board of Education of Arlington Heights School District 25 in accordance with the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the laws of the State of Illinois to the best of my ability. I further swear that I shall respect taxpayer interests by serving as a faithful protector of the school district's assets. I shall encourage and respect the free expression of opinion by my fellow board members and others who seek a hearing before the board while respecting the privacy of students and employees. I shall recognize that a board member has no legal authority as an individual and that decisions can be made only by a majority vote at a public board meeting. I shall abide by majority decisions of the board while retaining the right to seek changes in such decisions through ethical and constructive channels. As a, port, excuse me, as a part of the Board of Education, I shall accept the responsibility for my role in the equitable and quality education of every student in the school district. I shall foster with the board extensive participation of the community, formulate goals, define outcomes, and set the course for Arlington Heights School District 25. I shall assist in establishing a structure and an environment designed to ensure all students have the opportunity to attain their maximum potential through a sound organizational framework. I shall strive to ensure a continuous assessment of student achievement and all conditions affecting the education of our children in compliance with state law. I shall serve as education's key advocate on behalf of students and our community schools to advance the vision for Arlington Heights School District 25, and I shall strive to work together with the district superintendent to lead the school district toward fulfilling the vision the board has created, fostering excellence for every student in the areas of academic skills, knowledge, citizenship, and personal development. Welcome to the welcome to the board. Um, and yes, you'll share some work. Very quickly, I'd like to thank my family members and my friends for your love and support and help. 
I'd like to thank the community for your faith in me, and I'd like to thank my fellow board members and staff members for the careful care, consideration, and love that you share with our students every day. So thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. Okay, now that we've all memorized the oath really well, we will continue with our meeting. Thank you, and welcome, welcome to the new members. Okay, now that the new board is installed, we will have a second roll call. Board members, please state here when your name is called so that the minutes can reflect the attendance of the current Board of Education members. Lana, would you please call the roll? Scapolato? Here. Michael? Here. Faso? Here. Nierman? Here. Olenichuk? Here. Cerniglia? Here. Jogi? Here. Thank you, Lana. Moving on, we're going to go to the organization, which is appointment of President Pro Tem and Secretary Pro Tem. This is an action item. Um, are there any nominations president. for President Pro Tem? Madam President? Yes, Greg. I move to appoint you, Dr. Jogi, to serve as President Pro Tem. O okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, are there any other nominations? Um, I'd actually... Uh, uh, you could decline uh, the nomination. I would, yeah, no, I'm not going to decline, but I will ask um, my colleague, Brian Serniglia, thank you for the kind nomination. I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Brian Serniglia, if he would serve as president pro tem. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Brian, and thank you, Greg. Are there any other nominations? Okay, seeing none. Um, if there are no additional nominations, nominations are closed, and Brian Cerniglia will serve as the president pro tem. All right, let me get up to speed here. Where are we? Right at the top. Yep. Oh, yes. So, we need, so now we need to appoint a, a secretary pro tem. Uh, are there any nominations for this position? Secretary pro tem. And you can nominate yourselves. Don't be shy just for about 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll Mr. President you know. Pro Tem. Yes, th uh, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> I move to appoint uh, Greg Scapolato as Secretary Pro Tem. Thank you, Kevin. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Anisha. I think Gina, Gina got me before, oh, possibly. Gina got the second, all right. Yeah. Do we take a roll on that one? No, you don't need to. No, we don't need to. We don't need a second. Yeah, oh, we, we don't, don't, we yeah, don't right. need a second. Don't thank a second. you so much. Okay. Okay. We just need to determine if there's any other nominations. Are there any other nominations for Secretary Pro Tem? Seeing no one running for the microphone, I move to appoint Greg Scapolato as Secretary Pro Tem. All right. Now we move on to the organization of the election of officers and appointment of a recording secretary. Uh, no. No? No. Let me make sure no, you have the right. This one now. Secretary uh, recording secretary. That's what I was like. I, that's what it says. But you're right. That doesn't make sense. No, that should be left. Right now, you're going to read all. Yep. This. All right. Yeah. We will now elect the officers of the board of education: the president, vice president, and secretary. Additionally, we will then appoint a recording secretary. So can you read the fine print. Uh, following the guidelines, of the Illinois Association of School Boards: if only one member is nominated for any position. Um, that we may cast a unanimous ballot and declare that candidate elected. If two or more members are nominated for any of the positions, a roll call voice vote is necessary. Okay, a nomination does not require a second if it's the only nomination. The member receiving a majority of votes cast is elected. Once elected, the board president presides over the meeting as the board proceeds to elect the vice president, then secretary, and so on, using the same nomination and voting process that the board used to elect the president. So, without further ado, are there any nominations for the Office of Presidents? Mr. President Pro Tem? Yes. Um, I would like to, I move to nominate myself to continue to serve as board president. Thank you, Anisha. Are there any additional other nominations? 
No one's running for the mic on that one. All right. You can read that top. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Any nominations? Where am I? This, I don't. I don't like scripts. Yeah, I, know. I don't do well with them. Now you can just. You can just read this part. <laughs> All right. If there are no additional nominations, which there are not, the nominations are now closed. Uh, unanimous ballot is cast. Did you just see it? Uh, and Anisha, Dr. Anisha Gogi will serve as president of the Board of Edu Education, or will remain president. And I'll okay. take over for you. Take over, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, thank you. Thank you for serving as President Pro Tem, uh, Brian Siniglia. Um, we will now need to appoint a Vice President. Are there any nominations for the Office of Vice President? Madam President? Yes, Kevin. I move to appoint Greg Scapolato as Vice President for a one-year term commencing today, April 25th, 2023. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Are there any more nominations? Okay. Since, if, since there are no additional nominations, the nominations are now closed. A unanimous ballot is cast, and Greg Scapolito will serve as Vice President of the Board of Education. Congratulations, Greg. Uh, we will now need to appoint a secretary. Are there any nominations for the Office of Secretary? Madam President, yes, Brian. I would like to volunteer myself as secretary. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for that nomination. Are there any additional, any more nominations for secretary for the Board of Education? Uh, since there are no additional nominations, nominations are now closed. Uh, a unanimous ballot is cast, and Brian Signiglia will serve as secretary of the Board of Education. Congratulations. <laughs> we will now move forward. Finally, we will need to appoint a recording secretary. This is a role that we have typically had Ms. Lana O'Brien so graciously fulfill for us, for the board. Are there any nominations for the Office of Recording Secretary at this moment? <laughs> Madam She's President, like, I, yes, me. Greg. I move to appoint Lana O'Brien as Recording Secretary for a one-year term commencing today, April 25th, 2023. Thank you, Greg. And even though we don't need a second, we're all, <laughs> we're all seconding, thirding, fourthing, fifthing, and all the way up. Um, are there any more nominations to take on the brave role of Recording Secretary? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no additional nominations, nominations are now closed. A unanimous ballot is cast, and Ms. Lana O'Brien will serve as Recording Secretary of the Board of Education. Congratulations, Lana. I look forward to serving the board for another year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, we will now move on to setting of meeting dates, um, which is an action item. Uh, if I could please have a motion. Madam President. Yes. I move that the Board of Education approve the school board meeting dates, times, and locations for the 2023-2024 uh, calendar year as presented. Uh, please can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Greg. Um, Lana, could you please call the vote? Scapolato? Yes. Michael? Yes. Faso? Yes. Nierman? Yes. Olenichak? Yes. Cerniglia? Yes. Jogi? Yes. Um, uh, we're seeing family members of our new board members leave, so we're really thankful that they came, and uh, Kevin, your children were waving goodbye to you, <laughs> so, so you know, and we're so glad that parents and children and it's so it's so nice to see so welcome to you all and we're so glad that you're part of the district 25 a family um, so moving forward let's keep going with the meeting of dates and time here uh lori will so you actually all voted so you're all set with that so we can so move forward move okay and we're down to that one meeting a month, I see, and uh, hopefully that'll make Allison's job easier too, <laughs> she was saying. 
Okay, we'll move on now to the organization of the bank depository. This is an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Secretary. Yes. So, Madam Secretary, where did that come from? Yeah. I just love that new role. I can't wait to get into it. Yes, Mr. Secretary. I recommend that the Board of Education adopt the resolution appointing the treasurer and assistant treasurer of the school district and the bank depositories for the period July 1st, 2023 through July 1st, 2025. Okay, thank you, Brian. A second, please. Second. Thank you, Gina. Um, Stacy, is there information to share on this item? Uh, there's no changes in the bank depositories since the last time. Um, the only thing I will give you a heads up on is typically the assistant treasurers are the CSBO for District 214 and the assistant. Um, currently that position is vacant, so they have a temporary fill-in. We'll probably bring this back um, for the assistant treasurer appointments once they fill that position sometime after July 1. Thank you, Stacy. Any questions or comments for Stacy on this topic? Okay, seeing no questions, Lana, could you please call the vote? Michael? Yes. Faso? Yes. Nierman? Yes. Olenichuk? Yes. Cerniglia? Yes. Jogi? Yes. Scapolato? Yes. Okay, thank you, Lana. Okay, the board will now resume agenda items for our regular business meeting. And we will, we actually have no student learning reports, no student services reports today. So we'll move on to business and finance. So Stacy, if you could please provide a third quarter update to the board. Yes, um, I provided some detailed information in the board packet uh, that is available regarding where we are financially as of the third quarter. Um, it's important to remember that while our fiscal year is July 1 to June 30th, our revenues and our expenditures do not occur evenly over the 12 months. Um, our largest revenue source, for example, is property taxes. So that revenue comes mainly in two installments, typically in the fall, August and September, and then in the spring, March and April. Well, as you recall, this year the fall collection wasn't due until December, and the spring collection was due April 1st. So if you review the materials I included, you'll see that we're lagging behind in our revenue collections as of the end of March because of that spring property tax collection is delayed uh, because they weren't due till April 1st. Um, the other revenue piece I would just highlight is interest income is up significantly over where we were this time last year. That's due to two main reasons, one being the increase in the federal funds rate because that's tied, our investment rates are tied to the federal funds rates. We're earning more as those rates go up. Additionally, with the $60 million in bonds that we sold in the fall, those funds are earning interest on them as until we spend them down. So that's an, a, a large chunk of revenue that's earning additional interest. On the expenditure side, we are tracking at budget. We typically are. Uh, the majority of our expenses are personnel related, salary and benefits, and when we create the budget, we budget by person, by salary. So unless a position is vacant or somebody leaves or we have to add a staff member throughout the year, the salary and benefits should be very close to target, and they ha historically have been, as well as in line with prior years. Uh, we haven't used all of our contingency funds, so I do expect at the end of the year to be under budget with our expenditures. Um, so we'll definitely come in under budget on that side, but just a key note is every 1% in taxes that we don't collect represents about $700,000 in revenue, and every 1% of expenditures that we don't spend represents about $850,000 in expenses. So at this point, I would say assuming the re remainder of this spring collection comes in as, and, as budgeted and anticipated, that uh, we will end the year with more of a surplus than we anticipated in the budget. And as a reminder, this year's budget is a surplus because we sold 60 million in bonds, but we're, that's for the next three years. We have the additional 15 million to sell if we need it for the last two years of the five-year plan. So the revenue all came in this year, the 60 million, but it won't all be spent this year. The majority of, of it will be spent starting this June through um, the full day kindergarten construction, which should end August of 24. 
with a portion then for that last year capital project. So it's a surplus, although not an operating surplus. It's due to the bonds. Thank you, Stacy. Any questions or comments for Stacy? Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, we'll now move on to facilities management uh, for a summer construction bid award. This is an action item. Um, if I could, so it is an action item, yep. Yeah. Uh, please could I have a motion? Madam President. Yes. Secretary Sir uh, I move that the Board of Education award bid package number one base bid while rejecting alternates one and two for site work to Albrecht in the amount of seven, $714,250 for the 2023 capital improvements and immediately assign the contract with the contractor to Nicholas and Associates as our construction manager. Okay, thank you so much. Please may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Gina. Um, Ryan, Mr. Schultz, uh, uh, our Director of Facilities Management, um, do you have any in other additional information to provide on the Summer Construction Bid Award? Yes, good evening. This is for summer site work at uh, Dun El Dunn Administration Building here to replace the West Parking Lot and also the East Parking Lot at South Middle School due to the condition and need for replacement. Uh, we're looking to implement this work in the early summer of this year to get these parking lots replaced. These will be full depth removal of the parking lot, so it's not just a typical like mill and overlay. This is actually digging out the entire uh, base of the parking lot to getting a full depth removal. Uh, we're recommending to award the project without the alternates at this time because we believe that there's an opportunity to have an offset with the village for some property that uh, we currently have that we believe that an offset could happen to allow us to forego the stormwater uh, provisions on these two sites. So the reason we're looking to go forward with that, we looked at it from an engineering standpoint and a pragmatic standpoint on how this parking lot actually performs on, a, on the stormwater provisions. Uh, here at Dunton, we have the adequate stormwater facility across the street, so our water can flow into the facility across the street that was constructed three or four years ago. Uh, so our site already flows into that uh, facility across the street. And then also at South, we have a stormwater detention facility that was put in originally with the facility. Uh, we don't have, it's not really being used at this time. So the engineering wise, there's not water really flowing into it. So there's excess capacity left in there. Again, on a calculation engineering standpoint, they would say that we need to expand it. Uh, but we tried to prove that out and say that there's a pragmatic approach to this and there's still capacity available. So again, uh, we will bring forward a proposed agreement in the future uh, for that land swap. Again, it's a small parcel at Dryden Elementary School that's landlocked. So it's between a park district parcel and a village parcel already, a very extremely small sliver. There's no other way to get to that property unless uh, we would get an easement into that area. Again, it's only about 6,000 square feet. It was actually deeded to us from a development that was done uh, in the early 2000s. So the development was not able to use that land, so they actually just deeded it over to several entities in the area. So that's how we actually acquired that area. Uh, to be honest, we weren't even aware that it was ours until we started looking into the uh, title search for the property during the construction process. So that's when we actually learned of it. So the village is actually looking to do stormwater uh, provisions in that area, so that's why they would like to have that uh, property near the Dryden site. So again, uh, we're gonna propose an agreement in the future. If that would fall through, we'd have to consider uh, adding this alternate. So we're gonna have the contractor hold their pricing for a while and we would have to come back and amend uh, this approval to incorporate the stormwater detention at South and Dunton. But at this time, we believe that it's advantageous for all parties involved to uh, recommend to delete the alternate and uh, leave the sites kind of as is. Uh, so again, we're looking to go forward with this work this summer and I'll be open to any questions you may have. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions or comments for Ryan? Okay, you are super clear. So thank you for that uh, summary. Uh, Lana, could you please call the vote? Faso? Yes. Nierman? Yes. Olenicek? Yes. Cerniglia? Yes. Jogi? Yes. Scapolato? Yes. Michael? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next we'll move on, thank you, Ryan. Uh, next we'll move on to the superintendent report, uh, beginning with the Freedom of Information Act. Dr. Bai. 
Thank you. There is just one uh, Freedom of Information Act response that the board can see. Uh, response was provided on April 17th. Thank you, Dr. Byde. Next, we'll move on to the uh, Illinois State Board of Education compliance visit. Thank you. Um, every four years, uh, I believe the board's aware of this, the Illinois State Board of Education requires school districts to participate in extensive compliance review in order to ensure that school districts are following all the requirements in all areas, curriculum implementation, special education regulations, um, personnel licensing and employment, health and life safety, policy alignment, and student and family rights. Um, ISBE actually delegates this compliance um, work to their regional offices, or in our area, it's called an intermediate service center, the North Cook Intermediate Service Center. So District 25 just completed our participation in this four-year review. As a part of the review, members of the ISC reviewed comprehensive amounts of documents um, that we uploaded to an online um, compliance portal, as well as spent a day on site reviewing files, visiting schools, interviewing administrators and staff members. Um, we are pleased to report that District 25 received numerous commendations. I think you can see that in the report that you have and zero areas of non-compliance. Um, the compliance team did share three recommendations. Um, they do visit lots of school districts, so they like to share some ideas that they see from district to district. And finally, and importantly, an overall rating of full compliance was assigned. Um, many months of work go into preparing for a compliance visit, and so I wanted you uh, to know the substantial amount of work done by each of our assistant superintendents and their staff. Um, and moreover, Lana O'Brien uh, took the lead in creating a process by which we could provide all of the required materials um, and get them organized and uploaded. In addition to the commendations in the report, uh, North Cook asked to share our portal with numerous other districts to show them um, the successful templates that others could use to guide them uh, for their own compliance visits. Uh, again, Lana was highlighted at a opening meeting early this fall where North Cook invited all of the districts going through compliance visit and they said, you know, District 25, do you mind if we show them what Lana O'Brien created last year? And we're like, oh, that'll be okay. And then again this year they're like, can we continue to share this because it's really got best practice documents. Um, moreover, they asked our permission to use the format that each of our assistant soups created as they felt those were exemplars and ways to truly demonstrate literally hundreds of things in school code that we have to prove are being done in District 25. Um, so thank you, Becky, Diane, Brian, Stacy, Ryan, Chris, Adam, Sandy, and Shab for all of their work. Um, and we look forward to seeing the North Cook Intermediate Service Center review team in another four years. <laughs> thank you so much, Lori. Lana, the whole team, the whole admin team that has done a lot of work and with uh, really fruitful results. So thank you, everybody. Any questions for Dr. Biden regarding this compliance visit? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, we'll go to second reading of policies. And so uh, this is for Press 110. It's a continuation from Press uh, like I said, Press 110 of policies as presented to the board for a second reading. And this is an action item. Uh, before I call for a motion, it was neat to see that the compliance visit uh, looked at policy alignment as well. Mm -hmm. So it's neat that uh, we're recognized for all these different pieces, including the policy alignment, because I, I am truly uh, proud of our board team for working so hard on, uh, on our policy piece, and, and this is one example of it. So could I have, this is an action item as far as the second reading of the policies. Can I have a motion, please? Madam President. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. I move that the Board of Education approve the policies as presented. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Rich. Um, is there any discussion on these policies for Press 110? 
Seeing no questions, and of course this is second reading, so we've, uh, board members have discussed these policies at length during a policy committee. Um, so seeing no questions or comments, Lana, could you please call the vote? Nierman? Yes. Olenichak? Yes. Cerniglia? Jogi? Yes. Scapolato? Yes. Michael? Yes. Faso? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lana. Now we'll move on to second reading of policies for section six, which is instruction. This is an action item. Uh, could I please have a motion? Madam President. Yes, Greg. I move that the Board of Education approve the policies as presented. Thank you, Greg. A second, please. Thank you, Kevin. Is there any discussion on these policies? Madam President. Yes, Rich. So two I want to bring up, um, uh, 680 and 6230. So 680 is teaching about controversial issues. Um, again, both of the, and 6230 library media program, um, both of these were obviously not recommended by the majority of the policy committee. Um, in 680 specifically, one of the things that we discussed, and I think it's lacking in this, is though, it talks about you know ensuring that the school you know, all the material when we're teaching about controversial issues follows these uh, particular sets of criteria that are outlined but what it doesn't do is state that we will inform the parents that we will be teaching about a controversial issue this allows parents maybe a, a you know opportunity to uh, talk to their kids about what's coming up and make the decision themselves as to whether or not the child is appropriate to participate in that controversial issue. So this is one that I think should go back um, with additional language being offered or maybe getting input from the board here as to should that be added to this particular policy. So I'll let my board members weigh in and we'll move from there. Okay. Thank you, Rich, for that. Madam President. Yes, Brian. Um, so I attended this uh, policy committee meeting my, my takeaway, while on, on the surface I agree with Rich, my takeaway was that our communication processes and procedures, right, take care of that um, communicating to the parents. So it's not to say that we don't do it. We do. We have, that's, that's a, you know, an actionable item that's done on the communication side. So the discussion was more around do we need that to be policy? And um, I personally felt that it added more complexity to it, bringing it in and making it policy, then you are, we're gonna find ourselves being forced to define what controversial is, right? Because now we have a policy, so it's almost an escalation of commitment the way I looked at it, because now we have a policy that's gonna dictate that we have to say, oh, well, this is a controversial issue and we have to follow policy. So I think it's more appropriate the way we have it now in that our, communi our communication um, processes take care of that that informing of the parent element. So I don't know if I'm articulating this very well, I just kind of thinking off of the cup, but that's what I took away from it. So I just kind of wanted to counter both sides of the discussion for, for those that weren't there. Madam President. Yeah, uh, yes, Gina. So in light of what both Rich and Brian said, we, could, we might have the ability to solve this with simply putting the cross-reference to the procedure onto the policy as opposed to amending policy wording with procedure wording. It is in procedure. No, no, we can cross-reference it on the policy as a referenced document. I, I, okay, I think you wanna be careful because administrative procedures can change and um, so just, it still might align, but IASB, um, what, um, cautions boards to um, bring that into policy because it can change without board approval Correct. procedures? Correct, but what I think it does is it references that there is a procedure that can be applied to the policy. And yes, procedures can change at absolutely any time, completely agreed, that's operational standards, but instead of adapting a policy to contain procedural documents, it's usually better to reference in a policy to a procedure should something arise. But we have a procedure for every single policy. <laughs> that's a given. That, just, you know, that, that's, that's no. a given. Um, 
Th uh, thank you, Gina. And so, so Gina, let's uh, hold that thought for a second because the, the recommended action here is that the Board of Education approve the policies as presented. Um, hold that thought if um, for a second there, and let's let's hear about this this particular recommendation. Uh, and Brian, I want to thank you for attending that policy meeting, kind of weighing in. Um, and I ditto your thoughts and, and agree with uh, your what you shared. Um, are there any other thoughts or conversation that need to happen before we take a vote on this particular action motion? Sorry. Yes. Yes, Richard. Yes. So I'm again going back to maybe re-emphasizing my point on 680 before going to 6230 is that if administrative procedures we've just heard can change, and administrative procedures do not necessarily need to reflect the what what's described here in the policy, meaning. The policy doesn't say that we need to communicate to the community. Therefore, it can change. Just because it's, it's happening today means it can happen. It, we don't have to communicate tomorrow because it's not written in policy that that's our board's expectation, that that's what we should do. The second thing, if we're already communicating, Brian, to your point, we must have already defined what a controversial is, issue is. If we have an pr administrative procedure, we must have already defined it somehow, and therefore we're taking you know, some, some action on it. Let's put that into policy, saying that is what we want to do going forward, because as again we're saying, administrative procedures can change on a dime, which means we can change the definition of controversial issue, and we can change how we communicate it, or even if we would communicate it. So those are my thoughts on 680. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Any Ma other thoughts? Madam President. Yes, Greg. Yeah, so, so Dr. Bind, could you, uh, you enlighten us that there is an administrative procedure for every policy or nearly, if not, or as close as matters. So if it's not written in here, why do you do it? So it's not in there now, and you shared with us that we, ha we do communicate, so why? Because again, the board sets the broad policy that then directs the superintendent, and the superintendent then creates procedures to carry that policy through, right? So we have a couple of procedures that relate to this, right? Um, in terms of controversial topics, we have the seven that are defined in law that we must notify parents and give them an opt-out provision. We also notify parents of all assemblies, presentations um, that are presented by guest speakers. So we don't necessarily define, right, that the PTA play that they're providing um, for the staff is, or for the students are controversial, but we go ahead and notify parents of all presentations by third parties. It kind of covers that. But again, we also have the procedure that um, any of those opt-out provision topics, that parents are given notification and the opportunity to opt out. So basically, again, the board sets that broad policy. We have to put that in action. So we create procedures um, that we can utilize to make sure we're carrying out the policies. So Dr. Bynum, would you say um, that the policy is the board's end of governance and the procedures are the admins and district staff's end of operations? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions, comments about this particular 6 to 680. 680, thank you. Before we take this to a vote. Rich had more. We have more comments. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Richard, so, go ahead. Uh, the next one is the library media program. And again, um, the issue or the concern that I have on this particular one um, is in the way the program is outlined right now, even as we look at 680, which provides a standard for what's to be non-tolerant of, so 680 today provides a groundwork for uh, what should, what the district should view, non-tolerant of profanity or slander, uh, respectful of rights and opinions of everyone, informative, uh, balanced views, consistent with curriculum. That's what 680 does today about that particular um, um, area. But nowhere in our policy do we even provide that type of guidance that there are certain level of standards that we should look at in terms of the, the library program? We've already heard that the staff doesn't read all the books, new books are, that are coming into the district. Um, therefore, 
you know, I was looking at this, there's three things that you know, I know we've kind of talked about, um, but things that I believe should be within this policy. And the first one is really create a committee that uh, made up of parents, community members, teachers, that really would read all the material, all the books that come in to the district, right? Um, that way, as a community involvement, parental involvement, teacher involvement, um, we can be better assessed whether or not that book is appropriate for the age level that's being looked at or even for our particular district. Um, secondly is establish maybe a standard, which again, our attorney um, actually advised us to have a particular standard, whether it be uh, language, appropriateness for age, but have some type of standard that we can gauge that this is the standards where we judge um, or decide whether or not a book is appropriate for the age and that we should have. And again, I want to stress, we're a teaching library, not the public library. So the types of books that we'll have within a public library are going to be much different than books that are age appropriate within our teaching environment. Because as our policy today states, they should be aligned with our educational philosophies and our curriculum that we're covering. And then finally, maybe similar to what District 214 has, is the ability for parents to opt out or to say these books should not be checked out by their students. The technology's there. We have the ability. Uh, why we wouldn't give the parents the ability to say, hey, these books I feel my child should not read or be able to check out. And we should be able to move forward with that. Thank you, Rich. Madam President. Yes, Gina. Can I ask for just a clarifying question, please, of the policy committee members that were there? We had um, a robust discussion around the fact that, especially with the ebooks, that we are we have those links in the ebooks that take students out of the book, out of the ebook material, and onto alternative third-party websites that are not necessarily secured through our cybersecurity or vetted through our cybersecurity, which is why we did our cybersecurity review. Um, I don't see that. Anything has been has come up, nor do I see any notes on whether or not we've addressed this as part of library media. So to add to Rich's question um, and points, I just want to understand, was it contemplated and I just don't see the notes because I was not able to attend policy committee? Thank you for that question. Um, so I know that, um, you know, Dr. Fano had presented on that as well. Uh, and Lori, if you could also speak to that piece about the, the ebook concern that Gina had brought up. Um, any ebooks that um, we have um, now, right? We had a group of ebooks during uh, when we were in remote learning. Uh, those were a different situation. Any e e all materials now, Library Resource Center, um, that have any kind of links or multimedia access uh, utilizing our sorry utilizing our system on our devices or within our school district now um, we'll go through what mr. Fano reported on as they make sure that uh, links uh, that we have the correct continued filters and things like that so if it's using our device whether at home or here um, it would go through our filter system. So that's great, and thank you, Dr. Bine. I was wondering if it came up, though, as part of the policy discussion, as part of the policy committee. Well, I, th uh, well, I think uh, we had said that, um, and Greg reminded me, and we have the minutes as well, um, and Rich was there as well. Well, Rich, I don't know if you were there that day, um, that we had talked about you know, Mr. Fano would be presenting, we talked how it would be safe, that it was a different situation. So we did, I believe it did come up. Uh, Madam President, yeah, uh, so Gina, I don't, I don't recall, I mean, other than the comments you just showed, Dr. Jogi, um, you know, we didn't address it in specific to relation to this policy. And I guess I would, me personally, I would need to hear more on how, um, yeah, I would need to hear more about how you would, you or others might envision that uh, fitting into this policy. What I hear is a, a, an absolutely legitimate concern that relates to how um, this policy or others are implemented. So, I, 
I, I didn't understand your comments, Greg, sorry. Because you know, what I think Gina's concern is that there are hyperlinks that expose based on the content of the books that we have, not, sorry, based on books that are in the libraries that have hyperlinks that are active that pose a level of risk. And again, what we're looking for in the policy is to, um, the policy to either A, review the hyperlinks, make sure they're safe and da 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 da, da or B, disengage them, which would even be better to say, look, they shouldn't be there in the first place. Madam President. Oh. Would, Sorry, would could I just, Dr. Yeah, could, cool. thank you. If I could just jump in. I want to make sure, like, if a board member knows of a book that has a link that takes a student to an inappropriate site, I want to make sure that you share that with me directly, right? I know of one book that a parent had been upset about that a child could use a link. I followed that link, right? So, but if you're concerned about books ever having links, that's one thing. Yes. If you have a certain book, no. I want to make sure that you share that with me so that we're not saying books in general and there is one that I know of, right? So I want to make sure if you're thinking in general, a book should never have a link, again, that would only be able to go through if you're using our system, like yes. any other link would be able to go through, or if you have concerns about specific books. No, no, this is not specific. This is the media part of library media that I feel the policy seems a little bit light on, which is why I was looking for, and literally it was point of clarification on whether or not it was discussed and addressed or if it was side tabled just so that I had an understanding since I was not able to attend. It was not meant to spur spar operational conversation. It literally was just point of clarification for myself. Yeah, and, uh, and while the board had some general conversations, I didn't believe that we had any specific conversations of should we change, should we include, that kind of thing, other than working through Mr. Fano's audit of our cybersecurity. But, but, I, uh, but Dr. Ben, if I recall, like, I feel like as a policy committee member that I felt reassured that there was this one concern and that, that it was being taken care of and that, that there weren't any other concerns, and then Mr. Fano went over it. So I, then we didn't pursue it further because it was a point of awareness and it seemed like a non-issue and that there was safety around that topic. Anish, Madam President, sorry. Yes. This has nothing to do with the one link that has been brought before the board. This is in general. Mm -hmm. Hyperlinks are more prevalent. Ebooks are more popular. Curriculum moves into e-learning. Yep. We have a library media policy. I'm looking for the media governance and guidance within the policy that articulates our views on how we're going to govern hyperlinks in any book. It's not in, it's not in relation to anything controversial. It is any book with hyperlinks to third party because as we're discussing the review and a committee to review, our policy should contemplate the media side of a review. So that was my question and that it was innocent, it was not meant in any specific direction. Madam President? Yes, Greg. Yeah, I, I think it's, I'll just acknowledge that that's a very, again, valid question and valid concern um, and also hear how the interest in relating it to this policy. And, and what I would say is when I hear the concern, I hear it as a technology operational security concern. It doesn't mean it couldn't fit under here, but then <clears throat> um, we also have policies that address security and um, electronic, or electronic networks and how they are used in, in terms of safety of students. So um, while it is a concern that could fit under here. I think it might be, uh, and Dr. Bine, I would lean on you here as our uh, policy expert that, you know, a lot of these concerns, it's not just one policy. Um, we don't fit everything that, um, we don't put uh, cybersecurity into our curriculum policy, right? So these all um, relate to each other and work as a system. And so uh, I'm just suggesting that, Again, while it's a valid concern that maybe, at least in the way we're discussing it, it doesn't fit directly here. Okay, any other questions, comments 
on section six. Thank you for bringing up the points to those who have shared already. Okay, so so looking at this recommended action that which was read out that the Board of Education approve the policies as presented. Um, I'm going to move forward in um, asking Lana to call a vote and then I will, um, because there have been questions brought up, um, I'll come, uh, I'm going to suggest something else after we, t we address this particular because we have taken, we've read the recommended, uh, you know, we've had a motion and we've had a second, so we do have to follow through with this recommended action first. So seeing no other questions or comments, Lana, could you please call the vote on this recommended action? Olaninchak? No. Cerniglia? Yes. Jogi? Yes. Scott Bilotto? Yes. Michael? Yes. Faso? No. Nierman? Yes. Okay, thank you. At this point, uh, Gina, I had said, you know, to table that thought. I'm wondering, um, at this point, if uh, now this recommended action has passed in a majority vote here, I'm wondering if there's anything else that can be done. Dr. Biden, I'm going to lean on you. Yeah, um, I'm trying to, I can't mem remember the number, but we have an acceptable use policy which relates to technology. Let me pull that out and follow up with the board on that policy and see um, what it refers to to what you're discussing there, and we could bring that up as a policy that might include an edit to clarify. Um, Gina, is there anything else do you feel that, because um, I had asked you to table that thought, is there anything else you'd like Dr. Biden to follow up with? Okay. Okay. Rich, is there anything that you want to share? Okay. Thank you. We will now move forward to the first reading of Policies Press 111. Um, policies Press 111 have already been reviewed by the Policy Committee. These are presented to the board for a first reading. Are there any questions or comments on these policies? I'll just add in um, that, um, again, as the board knows, we have a procedure that um, a recommendation is unanimous when three out of three policy members agree to move it forward and less noted um, by the policy statement. So if there's two out of three, a majority, it still comes forward as a recommendation, but I note that for you. Um, this is a unique situation because on um, this one um, and I think the next two, um, we, only we were only able to have two members of the policy committee there. So it is brought forward, but I just wanted you to be aware of that. I believe that Chad Conley also attended that meeting, but not as a voting member. So the policies that you have in front of you recommended for your first reading um, really had two of the voting members present from the policy committee. Uh, thanks for, uh, for bringing that up, Dr. Bine. Um, any questions, comments on these policies, uh, press 111? Seeing none, um, and of course there's, yeah, I just want to bring up a comment that I, I feel strongly about and I'll kind of, I brought it up at policy committee and I'll bring it up again here. Um, as you saw this evening, uh, when we talk about policy, uh, duties, I believe policy 2-110, uh, there was a, I, I had, brought, because this policy came to us, this was a policy that we had discussed uh, not too long ago, so we're n we had decided that we won't, um, I don't know how I voted on that one at the, at, during the policy committee, but we had said we won't bring it up to the board. But I do want to uh, share that one of the items in that 2110 was uh, the term of office. And I continue to strongly believe that the term of officer positions, president, vice president, secretary, for leadership continuity, uh, for the sake of the kids in this community, should 
be two years instead of one year. And Tony Luzzi, our attorney, was there that day, and she, he said uh, again uh, that a majority of boards across the state of Illinois have those officer positions as two years and not one. So uh, I want to um, encourage the board, you know, uh, whether I'm here or not, um, in the future to bring this board up when it's time to bring it up. We want to follow process because we want to, since we already talked about it, we don't want to bring it up so soon, but it's still, a, I continue to think, as far as effective governance goes, to really consider that and when the time is right um, to bring that policy back up. Okay, Gina? Did you Madam have? President. Yes. I love your passion on the topic. Um, I will offer that I think that the biggest challenge we would have to overcome is it would have to be instituted to coincide with election years, otherwise you would run the risk of potential vacating of a spot midterm anyway. So I think the one year does continue to serve our board well at this time. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's another thing we thought about as policy committee that at this juncture wouldn't make sense, right? But uh, the next election cycle, so bring that up in, what would that be, two years? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, in two years, bring it up. Um, okay. that's. That's that. So are there any other questions, comments? We will move forward to first reading of policies, press 110. It's a continuation of the policies from the section that have already been reviewed by the policy committee. These are presented to the board for a first reading. Are there any questions or comments on these policies? If I could just add one update for the board. So you know that on these policies, anything in green comes from uh, IASB, their Press Plus service, and their policy attorneys. Anything in red also comes from the same place, so there's suggestions or requirements for additions or deletions. Anything in blue could come from three places now. It's either the board's attorney recommends it, the administration recommends it, or in this case, for example, in number three, that the policy committee after reviewing it, recommends that something be added um, or subtracted after their review. Thank you, Dr. Bain. Madam President. Yes, Rich. Um, so I do have some questions. Um, I know at the, the last policy committee that, we attend, that I was able to attend, um, on 660, there were some questions I had on mm -hmm. some content that was in press plus or i'm sorry in press uh, yeah that was not included in our um in our view of this uh, specific round number 17 and then the new law that was enacted about uh, gun safety yeah thank you so i can answer those um number 17 the language because it says in all schools the curriculum includes instruction as determined by the superintendent or designee on black history as mandated by law as that law changes, it oh. encompasses okay. more things, that's covered there. Okay. The other one, um, this, was a, this is why this is coming to the board now and not earlier as a first reading, because the policy committee had questions and things for us to research. The other thing is there is a law passed that we must teach students about safe gun storage. And that was the question about why don't we see that here as content, listed as content that we're supposed to teach. Um, we reached out to IASB and they shared that that goes under the health area and will be included in procedures once the board adopts the policy and updates the policy. So it falls under, I could probably find the number for you in the law, it aligns with number nine actually um, and therefore um, is in administrative procedures under that section. Yeah. And, and actually, we did bring that up, uh, Rich, so... Um, we did so discuss that. We did discuss it. And since you weren't there, maybe your ears were burning because we were thanking you for the, thorough, the thoroughness of your research on the policies it, because you brought up a couple of points. It was gun safety and uh, different policies about the diversity yep. piece. Was the addition uh, in number three. The addition in number three that was included. And so if you were getting hiccups, it's because we were... Uh, thanking you for your thorough research with policies. Um, and so all those were discussed. So I'm glad, and so that gun safety one was, we said, hey, you know, 
you know, thanks, Rich, for bringing it up. You went into the research, and now we know that it's going in a different policy. And that becomes effective in January of 2024. Okay, thank you. So just to clarify, it's going to go into a different policy, not in point number nine. No, it, it, it's the law connects it to number nine. So it's kind of like how number 17 was as mandated yeah. by law. It now becomes part of the um, components necessary to develop a signed mind and a healthy body, dangers and avoidance of abduction, age appropriate evidence for sexual abuse and assault awareness and prevention education in all grades. It actually falls in the law under that section now. So it will be in procedure as under those, including things like teaching kids safe gun storage. Okay. I just think it's odd that in other circumstances we call it the law specifics and for that one we toss it under health education. Hmm. Again, that's from, that's from your press press gu pl guidance from their policy right. attorneys. Madam President. Yes, Gina. Picky, picky, picky question here. On number three, why did we choose the words in addition instead of A, B, C, D, E? Because I can explain that. Yeah. So the first section uh, in kindergarten through eighth grade, provided it can be funded by private grants of the federal government, right? Mm -hmm. Those things need to be taught. The second section was a section that the policy committee wanted to add in, and it doesn't really have anything to do about whether it can be funded or not, but that in addition, anti-bias education and intergroup conflict resolution may be taught as an effective method for preventing violence, et cetera. So really it's not that um, it will be taught if there's funding, yeah. so whether there's funding or not, this is really kind of separate and says, in addition, we believe anti-bias education and intergroup conflict resolution may be taught as an effective method, et cetera. Okay. And I'm just gonna add to that, and that was a, another one where we were grateful to Rich for bringing that up as to say, hey, in the previous, in the policies, it, for some reason it was taken out and Rich's question was, hey, why was it taken out? Should we put it back in? Um, and based on his suggestion, we thought it was a good idea to put, you know, to keep that. Can I ask another question? Can I get some context on the choice of the word may? Does that mean out of all of our schools, some may and some may not? Yeah, so again, this is, yes, yeah, basically it means that we as a district may, not necessarily that a school has a choice, right, that we would determine as a district if this is a method that we want to teach, the context of this is really when there is tension in schools that even spill outside of the schools between or among groups of students, uh, whether that's from social, you know, their, their identity, self-identity groups, or in general. And so it's just saying that if we feel there is this tension between or among groups of students, especially based on divergent viewpoints, religious mm -hmm. beliefs, that this may be a, a method we could use to teach them about how to get along. It's not the method that we have to use, right? But that it is an option should we see that grow, attention growing in that way. Thank you. Thanks, Gina, for that question. Thanks, Lori, for the explanations. Um, it, it was actually a really a robust conversation during policy committee, and um, and Chad's not here. Hopefully, he's having fun having dinner. But um, you know, it was really interesting to have different perspectives, uh, and Chad had some interesting perspectives that day. And so, we always welcome board members to attend because um, it kind of informs our decision making as well. So, that it was a good discussion that day on, on the points that were just discussed right now. Okay, any other questions and comments? Okay. Yes, Rich. President, um, on 260 then, complaints about curriculum. Uh-huh, go ahead. So my concern on this one is, obviously it's a complete rewrite of our current policy on this one. And what I, what I wanna say is it takes away significant language that we had in the previous one where we talked about parents have the right to really object and that objection would really be you know, taken under consideration. The new language here and the way it's been um, 
implement into procedure. Okay, so again, I'm pointing these two things out. So the policy as it's being presented today talks about, and I'll, I'll maybe read it so I can you know, share, share the two, make the connection here for everyone. Um, in limited circumstances, so it's the last paragraph of the policy that's being recommended. In limited circumstances, parents or guardians of a student in the district with all other suggestions or complaints may seek to have the student exempt from a particular instructional material or program in the assigned school by submitting a curriculum objection form and returning it to the building principal. Upon review of the form, a determination will be made upon the request about the request for exemption from the curriculum instructional material or program and the parent guidance will be notified of the district's decision. Okay, so when you just read that, it sounds like, you know, the board's intent is for parents to be able to object or make exemption, or sorry, ask for exemptions out of the material. That's right, and that's as you read that paragraph, okay? What I then want you to look at, or not here, but let's look at the actual curriculum objection form that is available, and I've previously given out copies of this, and I'm gonna take a look at two sections here. A set forth in board policy 260 complaints about curriculum instruction materials or program objections to curriculum instruction materials or programs may be based on one of the opt out provisions within the school code, school code or a board policy expressly permitting a parental opt out. So then the exemption or the curriculum objection form lists out the eight areas that are allowed by law. So these aren't even they're opt-out provisions, meaning a parent doesn't even have to technically fill out the objection form. You're, a parent is allowed by law on these eight types of topics. You say, I don't want my kid to attend or be part of that curriculum and they can um, look out. So it's following that piece of it. But then the form makes one other interesting sentence. Exemptions that are not based on one of the statutory provisions above or an applicable board policy will not be granted. Okay, so now the only area, the only area in all our policies that we allow a parent or a child to be opted out is under dissection of an animal, right? Or really a frog. Otherwise, there's no other place in our policy that allows it. Yet the intent of our 260 says it implies that parents have that right to really exempt but the execution of that in a procedure changes that radically. So my view is that, you know, two things. The policy should list out, these are the eight exceptions, or the eight opt-out um, parameters to inform all our parents that, hey, these are the opt-out parameters that are allowed. They, they don't even have to exempt. It's by law. You have the opportunity to view that. And then be very, maybe alter this to say, hey, it's our intent that parents as part of the community involvement and being you know, involved, with a parent, uh, involved with their child's education, have the ability and no reasonable maybe process will, or reasonable exemption will be uh, you know, not denied, right? Because right now it just seems like parents have no control. Either it's opt out for one of those or if they don't want the kid to be, have, do a dissection, that's all they have the ability to, to do. Rich, does the form that you have go on and have a section too? I just want to make sure you have the most current form. Is there, the is most, a, there is another section. section where somebody can list other curriculum areas not outlined in those legally nope. allowed ones. This is what you're currently actively using. Let me pull it up, make sure that you have the current But either one. way, your form, the, the, if, yeah, please bring it up. If you guys have changed it within the last month, great. The form does allow um, in another section for someone to list something outside of those legally allowable opt-out areas. We do have families that will fill out that other section on things that they want out. Then we review those on an individual basis and make a determination on that. Well, so you have the structural material in question, but again, it goes back to the wording on this says exemptions that are not based on one of the statutory provisions above or an applicable board policy will not be granted. Seems pretty clear to me that. Yeah, again, then I need to have it in front okay. of me, but I'm telling you that we, have, we use it whenever someone wants opting out of anything else. Um, there is an area on that form where they can do that. Madam President? Yes, Greg. Um, setting aside the form, because that sounds like an execution and operational piece, uh, just to speak to the policy, uh, one part of our conversation at the meeting um, <clears throat> in terms of listing the things here, I believe it was Dr. Fitzpatrick shared that they change. 
much like we've talked about in other policies, we, we create a structure here that allows for those, the law to change without us changing the policy. So um, I just wanted to speak to why they weren't listed there or why we didn't feel need to change um, to have them listed. Can I just make a, sorry. Thanks a, for a sharing, comment. Greg. Yeah, sorry, maybe a comment on that. Yeah, Rich. The, the struggle I have with that is it seems like in some policies we list the law and some policies we don't list the law. It seems like it's a matter of convenience versus this is the process. So either we're going to be have policies that list the law and say specifically we're following this because of this law or we're not. I mean, we seem to be going wishy-washy on that particular topic. So. Hmm. Thank you, Rich, for sharing that. I, I, you know, we, uh, as far as I don't believe we're, we're uh, uh, that particular, you're stating that as far as wishy-wash, but, you know, our board attorney was in the room. We did uh, go over the discussions on this policy. Dr. Fitzpatrick was there that day as well. Um, other than that, are there any questions or comments? Maybe a question, for, this is first reading. Um, so Dr. Vine, as far as what Rich brought up, as far as the form and so forth, because you don't have it in front of you, be, if you. I do, we can, you know, um, there is a, I don't want to take too much time going through that again. We can always clarify the form, but we do um, make sure that we talk individually with any parent that's filling out so that they understand that there's a part one and a part two, um, and so that they understand how that form works. Um, but if anyone, again, we usually meet with any parent that fills it out. If we feel it's not complete, we make sure they understand uh, how that works. But, it, the, but the form does allow for what the policy says, right? Those automatic opt-outs um, due to law or board policy, but also a request to be exempt from a material, a program, a unit, et cetera. Maybe, uh, Rich, maybe that's a, before the, before it goes to second reading, maybe it's a good mm -hmm. point for you to connect mm -hmm. and make sure you have the right, the right forms um, so that uh, we're looking at the same thing. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments? Okay, let's go ahead and move on to first reading of policies for section six, which is instruction review. Um, now, this is a continuation of policies from Section 6 that has been reviewed by the Policy Committee uh, and are being presented to the Board for a first reading. Are there any questions or comments on these policies? 610, Educational Philosophy and Objectives, and 630, Organization of Instruction. Okay, seeing none, no questions there, we will move forward, and it was, uh, as far as policy committee goes, uh, I think we said this last time, but we kind of adjourned the policy committee for this year, correct? Um, and remind me, po my policy committee colleagues, how many times did we meet this year? Four times? Four, five? Let's say four or five. Yeah, four or five times. A lot of time and consideration, again, uh, uh, went into this. And a thank you to my colleagues, Rich and Greg, for serving on the policy committee. Um, committee assignments are going to come around the next time. So if this sounds like so exciting to uh, any of our other board members and they would like to serve on policy committee, uh, j jump on um, and, and kind of see kind of, you know, all the, the wonderful things that go behind policy. At this point, we will move forward to our superintendent search topic. This is a, a bittersweet topic for, for us as a board, um, but definitely um, a very important topic. And so we're going to be, uh, you know, as, as the community knows, as our board knows, that Dr. Lori Bine, um, who has steered the ship here at District 25, will be retiring next year. And um, we're, so this is not a goodbye at all. We're not saying too many goodbyes today. We can't handle it. Um, but we're going to, uh, as far as our responsibility as a board, and it's one of uh, the Board of Education's main responsibility is the employment of a superintendent. 
and it is that time for the board to begin the process of identifying a superintendent for District 25. Uh, definitely that superintendent is going to be filling really large shoes. Uh, and typically a timeline includes approving a contract no later than December, January, with an employment start date no later than July 1st of 2024. Now to assist the board in beginning the process, uh, uh, Dr. Bynes supported uh, me in looking at and soliciting superintendent search proposals for numerous search firms. Seven proposals are attached for the board's review. You can see the process is similar for most of the pro proposals, right? There's uh, superintendent search firms go through. The process can include gathering input from the community, which is really important, that stakeholder information uh, from our community as to what, our, what is our community looking for in our next superintendent, right? So having that feedback, and advertising this position, determining a slate of candidates for the board to review and to interview, and performing background checks of final candidates, right? So also attached is a summary of the fees from each of the firm's proposals. The Board of Education needs to determine the following things, right? So this is kind of a first glance that you're looking at all the proposals and the information and so forth from these different search firms. So we have to determine, and I have thoughts on this, but I want to open it up to my colleagues, is number one, do we wish to utilize a search firm to facilitate the process of finding our next superintendent, right? Number two, if not, what process would we like to use? Number three, if we would like to use a search firm, how would the board like to determine which search firm to use? And then would we choose among the written proposal? Would, do we want to invite some more or all of the search firms to a special meeting um, where we interview the search firms uh, to present their proposal in person and answer board questions? Uh, the board's attorney, of course, uh, Tony Luizzi can provide guidance if needed. Um, if the board decides to utilize a search firm, they will guide the board through each step in the process. Um, and then the board's attorney can assist the board in negotiating a contract with the board selection. And Dr. Bine has kindly offered and shared her support to the Board of Education in any way uh, as we see fit. So she, she, you know, as little or more as we need. Um, from, uh, so that, that is a gracious offer as well. So this is a really serious obligation that the board, I know, does not take lightly at all. So I'll open up this, this kind of topic, uh, the superintendent search topic for comments and questions, and, and I have some input that I will share after I hear from my colleagues. Madam President. Yes, Rich. So my thoughts, just maybe going down the series of questions that you have is, I think a search firm is well worth the investment. Two, we should narrow down the group of seven down to maybe three, and then bring in the three for a conversation um, at that point. Um, assess the seven based on what they provided, and then you know come down to the three. And you know, just like we look at other things, have a whether it be some sample criteria that we're looking for, but then you know, determine it from those three. Um, I don't think, you know, a special meeting would be fine, but I do think all three could be presented even in that one special meeting. It's just a matter of timing, yep. right, um, during those processes, and we go from there. Thank you, Rich, for that. Any other comments, questions? Madam President? Yes, great. Yeah, I just want to concur with Rich. Uh, this is uh, one of the highest stakes. Uh, it, it is, you know, actions that we have. It's in, like, the first thing you read about what a board does is hire a superintendent. So I agree that um, the investment in a search firm, it absolutely, it'll pay dividends in the future. And um, I also agree with Rich uh, that, yeah, if we could narrow to three and bring those in, and I think those conversations and questions will um, help clarify for us which is the best fit for our district. Th thanks a lot, Greg. Um, so we have seven at the moment. Um, I agree with, with both the comments made by Rich and Greg uh, that definitely that a search firm can help us through the whole process um, and kind of, you know, be our accountability partners as well in this process. And that stakeholder engagement piece is super important, which uh, looking for a search firm that has a robust stakeholder engagement to really hear from our community as to what are 
what does Arlington Heights District 25 need from our superintendent? That piece will be important. So, um, so right now, like we said, we have seven. Now, how should we work on narrowing down those to three? Um, Madam President, yes, I sir. think before we obligate ourselves to three, yeah, because that's just a number. Yep. <laughs> I think I don't, no, 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 no yeah, else, but right, you know, yep. is it three? Is it two? Is it four? I don't know. Yeah, right. We got to read these proposals yes we have to do some evaluation yep. it may not be three i just want to pose that yep um other than that i, I you know i completely concur I, I think it would it would behoove us to definitely choose one and but in that process you know we may weed down and only i definitely think talking to a few yep. would be appropriate agreed so um now uh so I, I wonder if we should say, hey, let's uh, let this marinate a little bit more, the proposals and so forth. Let, let's look at it. Um, and maybe when we come back to the next board meeting, uh, have some thoughts on how are we going to narrow it down? Should we narrow it down to three or four or however many? Or are they interested uh, uh, you know, in looking, for each of us looking at it, are they, uh, the search firms that we feel like, okay, these are super important. Um, how does that sound? Uh, and Dr. Bain, uh, feel free to chime in. You've. It's um, uh, your fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, feel free to ch chime in as far as, uh, you know, we, uh, as far as uh, our board and the, the attorney and so forth, I want us to really be hold fast to a timeline of making sure that uh, by you know by July 1st, 2024, we have one, but actually before that, right, this December, January timeframe. So if we, at the next board meeting, sorry, Rich. I just, thank you very much. June 30th, 2024, well, so a year and a half. Okay. So, right, so yeah. a typical timeline, doesn't mean it has to be typical, but a typical timeline is that the board would determine a search firm if that's what you're gonna do. Um, by June, um, typically, that search firm would do their work and a board would go through the whole process and be awarding a contract no later than December of 2023, yeah. but with that contract typically having a start date of July 1. Again, there's lots of options for the boards to do transitions and things like that. But so, so typically your your intent or hope should be that you have the July 1, 2024 superintendent under contract by December of 2023. Yeah. This coming December. The search firm board. No, no the, that the you have the camp. So I was hired in December okay, yeah, yeah. to start well, the boarding. following yeah. July, yeah. right? So, yeah. so you want to have a search firm by yeah. in yeah. June or so? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. You no, want yeah. to choose just choose a search firm, like now or by June? Yeah. Um, so that they can start their process. Madam President. Yes. Uh, sorry. Go, um, Gina, and then Brian. Um, so, Dr. Bain, could you offer up some thoughts? Uh, obviously, there's got to be succession planning. Obviously, we have uh, you have a great staff. If we choose a search firm or don't choose a search firm. Could you talk a little bit about if we had an internal candidate mm -hmm. and if we were, since we're discussing search firms, um, if an internal candidate had an interest and wanted to pursue um, the possibility of interviewing for it, how would that work if we chose a search firm, please? So good question. So any candidate would have an opportunity to apply a search firm. They've written it in their proposals, but they all typically advertise in the same places, um, especially those that are well known in our area. So anybody external or internal would go through that application process and submit their application directly to the search firm. Um, the search firm does all initial paperwork reviews and then starts interviewing candidates. Typically then they bring a slate to the board of five or six candidates. Now the board, again, can customize the search in many ways. And the board can say things like, we want, search firm, we wanna make sure any internal candidate at least gets to meet with you in person in round one. Or you could say, we wanna make sure any internal candidate is part of a slate that actually comes to the board. So you can set some of those parameters um, on if you have expectations that internal candidates at least get to a, port, a part of that process. 
Yeah, good, good question, um, Gina. Uh, you know, as we know, uh, definitely the, the process of putting it out there, but as we know, there have been many superintendents who have been cultivated right here at District 25 under Dr. Bynes' leadership who have uh, moved on to serve as superintendents in other districts. So th definitely that, that is um, a, a great, like keeping that, uh, having that talent cultivated here is a good, you know, a good starting point to also have included uh, in this process. So um, I'm very conscious of this timeline and so I, if I could ask the board to pour over these contracts even more and then by May have some concrete ideas so that by at the May board meeting, we have kind of narrowed it down and then we'll have to see if we call a special meeting or have it at the June board meeting. We'll, we'll talk about that as far as starting to interview so that by June, we have a search firm ready to go. Does that sound right? Uh, a little more aggressive than that, but yes, I would. I would say my interpretation, based upon what we just said, is that whether the number is two or four, yeah, I'd say somewhere in there, um, we should have our individual and then collective number of search firms that we want to speak to determined by May. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm just yeah. working backward yeah. off yeah. of the yeah. June timeline because yeah. by June we want to select. Yeah. So, so if we're going to talk to them, we got to know by May. If we're talking a one, two, three, or five, yeah, right, or seven, or seven, so I Madam, can tell based Madam, upon what I see, I won't yeah. be talking to seven. But um, anyway. and, and this interview process happens in open meeting. Is that how it happens, Stephanie? Yeah, when you um, ask when a district uh, board of education asks a search firm to come and present, they do that in open session. Um, so you could either do it as part of the May meeting. Most. The typical is that a board schedules a special meeting specifically for search firm A, and then a special meeting specifically for search firm B. Now they can be on the same night. You might say our first meeting is XYZ date from 6 to 7 p.m. Our next meeting is the same date from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Um, but typically you are um, scheduling a specific time to meet each search firm. It, a board can say, here's eight search firms we want to meet. We want you to all come at this day. You're going to go first. You're going to go second. So you can do that. It's just probably not the most professional thing to do to make them all present, you know, and wait for each other. Um, speed yeah, <laughs> speed dating. Um, but typically you're scheduling, again, either as a part of a regular meeting or yeah. you're scheduling a special meeting which is more common because you're focused on this one topic yeah. um, where you can meet them, hear their presentation in person, and you can ask any questions. Yeah. Madam President. Yes, Gina. Cool. Just a question for clarification. If there is an internal candidate or an internal slate of candidates, do we have to use a search firm or could it be our prerogative to just interview our internal candidates before making a decision on a search firm? Yeah, so a board does not have to use a search firm. Um, sometimes a board does a large search themselves, like they appoint a couple of people on the board to advertise it and do whatever. Sometimes a board says to their current superintendent or their current staff, would you advertise this? Would you collect resumes? And then would you bring those resumes to us? Sometimes a board um, can decide, you know, if there's one or two people we already know and we want to talk to them, whether they're internal or external candidates. That's something, of course, that if you're going to talk about a specific person, you're going to talk about together in closed session, right? Um, so a search firm never has to be used. Um, it is very common in our area because they have the expertise, because they have really the networking as well to cast a wide net, but also it can assist a board in the process and making sure that it's legally followed along the way. Um, and again, narrow down for a board how many candidates you see. There are several school districts that have already appointed their superintendent for July 1, 2024 by um, choosing internal candidates without utilizing a search firm. So it's all an option. Right. for the board. I, my benefit, uh, Gina, good question. My, um, uh, my take on a search firm is the, the community engagement portion of it. Like I really think it's important 
because we've had a great track record of, of superintendents in this district, that, that uh, even, even if we land on an internal candidate, that that process of that community engagement and getting the feedback, the stakeholder engagement, that piece is, a search firm would help us really hear the voices of our community. Okay. Madam President? Yes, Greg. I just want to bring us back to the timeline. Um, and as a reminder to my colleagues, we do have two meetings in May. So the first meeting on the 9th could be that um, narrowing, if, the, if that's the route we go, to uh -huh. uh, winnow that list. Um, and that would still leave us several weeks in May to schedule the meetings uh, if we are going to interview firms. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Greg. Um, Brian, I, I do, you know, I, I'm with you on the urgency of it. How does that sound? May 9th uh, come with these, you know, kind of narrowed down, really think about, like, Really, if we look at it, our, you know, think about are we going to be on budget? I, I had asked Dr. Bine uh, uh, and Stacy's here, like, is there uh, like a budget tops for us for a, a topic like a search firm? You know, they all come with a price tag. Um, and apparently the answer was like, go ahead, Lori. So this will typically um, be part of your 23-24 budget. That's when you would typically start paying the search firm and we will actually create that budget to include the consultant fees should the board use a search firm. Um, the board determining which search firm has us be able to budget more closely. There is a range of cost on here on your spreadsheet, but um, that's something Stacy will budget for when she knows, when we know, yes, we're using a search firm that will become part of next year's budget. Okay, thanks Dr. Bine. So, um, uh, Brian? Yeah, Madam President. Um, just to further echo what we've already talked about from a timeline perspective, knowing what I know about this wonderful group of myself and colleagues, um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we're probably going to need a special meeting. Um, and it's got to be in May. So I just kind of want a straw poll if anybody disagrees. Because if we try to tack something that could potentially be, you know, a lengthy conversation onto one of the two main meetings, I, I don't think it's going to work. So personally, I just want us all to kind of either look each other in the eye and nod that we agree. Yes. And if we agree, then I would like to solicit the support of our lovely Mrs. O'Brien to maybe give us a hold the date type of thing. At least I think we should get something on the calendar, yes. whether it's two firms or four firms. I think it makes sense. Yeah. Um, I don't like the speed dating idea, so we got to work around that. But I think the same date can yep. probably work. Yep. We just got to figure out how to do it respectfully and tactfully so that it's not, you know, speed dating for search firms. Whatever the board needs me to do to assist with the superintendent search, I'm more than happy. Thank, thank you, Lana. Uh, uh, so how about we uh, how about we meet on May 9th, um, and in between the May 9th, or the first May meeting and the second May meeting, we find a date in the middle there to um, meet with said number of um, search firms that we decided on on May 9th. So look for a date in between those two. Madam President. Yes. Might I also suggest we contemplate if we can repurpose the second May meeting yeah. and, and adjust the things in the second May meeting that are critical to the first May meeting. And yeah. therefore we don't have to necessarily pick Meet up three times extra meetings. Yes. Th uh, thanks, Gina. So what, what I will do, um, I'm going to, uh, as I, put the agenda together with Dr. Bine as board president, we'll have a look at if we do need that second May meeting and if not to repurpose it um, because the weather will be nice and we want to be with our families outside. Um, so we'll definitely, we'll do that. Um, so so let's, so I'll, I'll touch base with Dr. Bine like I always do uh, about agendas and meetings. So we will know uh, May 9th as far as this narrowing down and then keep moving forward at an aggressive pace, <coughs> but effective pace. Um, Greg. Madam, I'm just, just uh, vamping on my colleagues here, and uh, I really like Tina's idea, and I would just only suggest that uh, it might not be all or nothing either. It might be a cut down uh, regular, I'll call it a regular meeting, with then scheduled, um, I know they're open session, but later sessions for these firms. Okay. On that same night. Right, like let's say there's a, a one or two pieces of business we really have to do. Well, yeah. we could still just do those. We wouldn't have to do all the elements we do in every meeting necessarily. 
Sounds good. No, thanks for that. We'll take that, uh, Dr. Ben and I will take that into consideration as well. Um, at this point, I will, um, and if there's no other further suggestions or input from my board colleagues, I'll move on to the next topic, which is our uh, second community input. Um, and I, I love the generous timings that we put on how it said we should get that 1040, but you guys were record timing, we're at 935. Um, so second public comment, if you wish to address any item on the agenda, please complete one of the forms provided and hand it to Lana. Lana, do you have any blue forms for a second? Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have future agenda items. Dr. Bain? Yeah, so we are uh, looking at uh, scheduling the student achievement and assessment, so May or June. We're trying to figure out everybody's calendar for that. Um, the, we will do a ruler update, especially considering we have new board members um, at a May meeting. Um, and then again, we continue to look for a board meeting uh, for the, uh, with the Arlington Heights Park District. Um, and I'll also add, just as a reminder, something that's coming is a long-awaited special education audit that NSSEO did. They've done an incredible job. I believe that's going to be on the May 9th um, agenda as well. A lot of information for you at that. Great, thank you. And that, that's the one that Judy... Dr. Judy Hackett, they, uh, when I was at NSSEO, Dr. Judy Hackett was saying um, she was, you know, as she's retiring, she was so excited that before she retires, she gets to work with District 25 in doing this audit, so she's really looking forward to, to present to us. Um, uh, and before we move on to new topics, uh, I, know, I know it's not a topic with dates to be determined, but it, it, it's a topic none the, the the less, which is like currently at your desks, folks, you'll see this new school board member handbook um, that uh, Lana and Dr. Bine put a lot of thought into. Uh, and of course, this is for our new school board members, uh, but it's also a, a great resource for us as we welcome our new board members. And, uh, and I want Liz and Kevin to, for you both to know that if you ever have any questions, um, Feel free, Dr. Bine is always at your disposal. Us as board members on a one-on-one -on -one basis are always at your disposal. So pick up the phone, text us, uh, whatever you need. And this, uh, this resource is for you and for us to continue to support you to be the best board members for this community. So thank you, Lana, for putting this together. Um, so moving on to new topics, are there any new topics that have been previously discussed with Dr. Bain? Madam President? Yes, uh, Rich. Uh, one of the new topics that I'd like to, for the board to get an overview session on is we just approved policy 6-130, which is the gifted program. Um, so I'd like to get a, an overview of what is our gifted program, what are the measures, what are the achievements, what are we doing with that particular program? Okay. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Dr. Ben, do you have that down? Yeah. Yep. The board, that is a topic the board's interested in? Yeah. Great. Yeah, let's, let's take a short poll on that. Um, can I just take a short poll if uh, board members would like that topic on as far as gifted education? Yes, let's. As a, yeah. And as a reminder for the board, the advanced placement program, accelerated placement program, is under review. It starts later this spring. Um, so we could share with you how, what that is and how it works now, but know that that's going under significant study. Again, separate from the policy Rich is referencing. So we could share some information, but basically we'd also be saying know that this now is starting significant study for that program. So as a timeline, would the fall be a better timeline to bring up what uh, Rich is suggesting? Um, yeah, it definitely wouldn't be before the end of the school year. Okay. So fall's great. Okay. So uh, so I just want to take a straw poll. Um, would you be interested in this topic, Brian? Uh, Rich, of course. Yes? Yeah. Yep. Um, so the, um, it fits into our programming schedule, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, I'd like to see that too, and on appropriate timing. 
Yeah, Madam President, just when you say that topic, so we're talking the all gifted. inclusive of advanced. Um, uh, no, I think we're just talking about the gifted education topic that Rich would like, uh, has suggested that we bring forward. And so how does that conform? To, then what did you just say about the fall? And oh, on a timeline basis. When that we would bring it to the board. To the board. Okay. And that would. They'll both kind of overlap. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. That, that's what I'm it suggesting. It's hard to present one without sharing some connection. To Thank you. I just want to clarify we were talking about wrapping both. all this up together in one package. So, okay. Thank you. Yes. Sounds good. Kevin, are you a thumbs up? Yep. Okay. Sounds, it sounds like the board would like to see that. Uh, topic. So thanks, uh, Rich, for bringing that forward. Um, at this point, if the board will be going back into closed session and the board needs to return to closed session to continue working on the same topics announced earlier for closed session, the board cannot take any action during closed session and we will not be taking any action when we return to open session afterwards. So do we have a motion to adjourn to go back into closed session? Madam President. Yes, Rich. I move that we adjourn to move back into closed session. Thank you, Rich. Second. A second. Thank you, Gina. Lana, can you please call the roll? Cerniglia? Yes. Jogi? Yes. Scapolato? Yes. Michael? Yes. Faso? Yes. Nierman? Yes. Olenichuk? Yes. Okay, thank you and good night, everybody.